went, you know, he was talking like he ought not talk. He was going back doing things that he ought not do. So let me talk to you about like this. And now, Natanya, I know I emailed you the, the order, but I'm going to go out of order just a little bit here. I want to take you to Matthew 14, and I want to talk to you primarily tonight. I want to talk to you about his determination, his defense, his denial, his declaration, and his death. And yes, and I just dreamed all that up. Actually, not too long ago. I want to show you the Apostle Peter and the power of courage. First of all, his determination. I find him in Matthew 14. And if we can look at Matthew 14, and I think it's verse 22 is where we'll, we'll start. And we're going to find a situation where they had gotten into a boat. And, uh, and, and, and here it is. Let's just look at it real quick. And we're going to talk here about his determination. I'm telling you, he had the courage to be determined. But then we'll find he also had the courage to be defensive. We're going to find that he had the courage to make a declaration. But we'll also see before it's over that he had the courage to deny. You see, now courage, as I said, keep this in your mind, it inspires us one way or the other. We can be blessed and emboldened and encouraged to do good, and that courage on display wants, makes us want to do something courageous. Or, on the other hand, we can see courage that's demonstrated in a bad way, and we can decide to do something bad as well. You can watch a bully and see him beating up on someone else and decide, well, I think I want to be a bully. That's not courage. That's cowardness or, or cowardice, if you will. Can you say amen? Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and he go before him to the other side and while he sent the multitude away. Now, you've got to understand, Jesus had just fed 5,000. I don't have time to go over it all, but he told his disciples to get in the boat, but nonetheless, and when they had sent the multitudes away, he went to a mountain himself to pray, and when the evening come, he was alone there. So he fed the 5,000, he sent them home, told his disciples to get in the boat and go to the other side, and then um, he went up on the mountain to pray. So as he goes on the mountain to pray, he said, But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went walking to them. Walk, I mean, he went on the sea. He's walking on the sea. This is Jesus walking on the sea. huh? Now, how many of y'all ever walked on water? I'm talking about more than just a couple inches, right? Deep. And anyway, uh, they said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. Verse 27, but immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Now, uh, I want you to notice here is the courage that comes from the apostle. Peter says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Someone says, well, why Peter? He's always the one in the limelight, always the one speaking up, always first. He's always with Peter, James, and John. It's always them three. Every time something great happens, somebody gets raised from the dead. From the Mount of Transfiguration, God shows up. Who's there? Peter, James, and John. Uh, God knew how to took an old, old rough guy like the Apostle Peter and use his old rough, callous character and turn it into something great in the kingdom of God. The Apostle says... I want you to see the power of courage right now. He says, bid me come on the water if it's you. Now, I'm telling you, they got other, there's other disciples right there that's watching him. I bet you there's some saying, man, look at Pete go. Boy, I wish I could be like him. The Lord said, come. He knows sooner. He didn't think about it. He didn't have a board meeting about it. He got up, started walking. Now, people look at him. Look at him, man. God is getting Jesus. Maybe he gave him something he hadn't given the rest of us. I don't know. But... But his courage inspires other people. So, but of course, you know the story. He got out there and he took his, oh Lord, he took his eyes off of Jesus like some of us have done and start watching the wind or, or other people or the waves. That means maybe circumstances. And I hear the boisterous noise and the sound and all of that gets my mind off of where it ought to be and Peter began to sink. But... 
rather than going down in defeat, we find the great apostle saying just before he goes under the water, Lord, save me. It takes courage to admit you need saving just before you die. He admitted, Lord, save me. And Jesus reached down, picked him up, and said, Wherefore didst thou doubt? Listen, friend, if you're going to have courage, there's going to be times you're going to miss it. If you have courage, there'll be times you're going to miss it. And when Jesus reaches down, he sort of rebuked him and said, Why did you doubt? Why did you quit looking at me? Why did you take your eyes off me? And I imagine the other people back in the boat said, Well, look at him, man, he sank, man, he sank. Jesus had to save him. Where was your scrawny behind? Still in the boat. Right? You wasn't piped up saying, well, if it's you, Lord, bid me come. Thank God. You know what? Peter did get uh, rebuked by the Lord on more than one, on more than one occasion. I'm going to show it to you in just a minute. There was another time. Well, I'll go ahead and show it to you now. There was another time since we're in this vein where... Jesus was talking about uh, going to Jerusalem, talking about dying, talking about giving up his life. And, uh, and, and Peter says, no, not so, Lord, it shall not be. And all it goes on like this. And Jesus looked at him, watch this, and said, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, some of y'all would have left church over that. Now, if it were me, I'd have called you Satan, you know. I mean, but, but you know what happens? Uh... He, get thee behind me, Satan. In other words, you're not seeing it the way God sees it. You're not seeing it the way I see it, he says. Listen, he turned and he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. Listen, when we get so full of the things of men, we will not please God. Lord, help me. So, uh, his determination, though, he, he is... is he had the power of courage. He was determined to do something great for God. If God asked him to get out of a boat, he got out of the boat. He didn't ask 10,000 questions. He said, God said, come, I'm coming. We find him in the same way. You remember when he and John, the beloved, ran to the tomb after he was raised from the dead? John outran Peter. Peter was older, heavier. John outrun him. He was a young, spry chicken. But he got there and was scared to go in. Huh? But when Peter, I can see old Burley. I, I think about William Cribbs when I think about possibly, you know, old Big. He come down, and he might not have been the fastest one, but he didn't stop at the door. Huh? He went right on in and said, "Where's he at?" Huh? You see, courageous and that kind of courage inspires other people. I'm telling you, friend, if you'll display some courage in your life, I'm talking about refined courage. I'm talking about courage that'll please God. If you'll display that kind of courage, God will raise you up as a model for young men and for young women to follow after. Oh, goodness. Lord, listen. So Peter was determined. He says, uh, uh, Lord, if you... Uh, want me to, I'll do it. I, I'm asking you to get determined. Determination will give you that power of courage. If you get determined to do something, Lord have mercy. Uh, let me move on. And then there was another time I want to talk to you about Peter's defense. Peter's defense, uh, they come to arrest Jesus one day. And I'm telling you, he wasn't no coward. The Apostle Peter was not a coward. You would not want to tie up with him before he met Jesus. In fact, even after he met Jesus, there were times they come to get his Lord. And when they rushed up to Jesus, the first impulse hit him and he pulled out his sword. Man, what was that? Somebody's ears fell off. Jesus turned to him and said, Peter, this is my ecology. I've been trying to tell you for three years. You can't do it the way you used to do it. He reaches down and picks the ear up, puts it back on the high priest servant named Malchus, right on the side of his face. He said, Peter, if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. I, let, me, let me exhort you right here. I thank the Lord saying, Peter, I appreciate your courage. I, I'm so thankful that you're courageous, that, that you're willing to stand in my defense. But there's a time and place. There's a way to do things. Are you with me? Say amen. So he, he wields his sword. He cuts off this guy's ear, you know, and, that, and that's how it was. Uh, it, it, he was willing to die. In fact, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. 
It's bad. Let me, that was his determination. Then we see his defense right here. But now I, I want to show you something else. Um, there was a time, this has to do with his declaration. We talked about his determination, his defense, his declaration. He sat one night, and, and this is not in the notes, Tanya, but just, just humor me. He sat at the Passover supper, and while he was at the Passover supper, Jesus gave a speech as he was talking to him and dipping his bread. He said, tonight... All of you shall be offended because of me. For as it is written, the shepherd will be smitten and the sheep will be scattered abroad. He says, uh, hello, well, hey, hey, I ain't going nowhere. I, I'm not leaving you. He said, uh, if I should die with you, I'll in no wise deny you. And uh, Jesus says, Peter, I tell you tonight, before the cock crows twice, You'll deny me thrice. Though I should die with you, I'll in no wise ever leave you. I'll never deny you. Be careful how you speak. Be careful how you speak. You see, he had courage that night, but you know what he had courage in? He had courage in himself, in his belief. He was a strong and a boisterous man and a burly man. I'll tell you something, friend. I'm going to tell you, even strong, boisterous, and burly men get scared too. And all of a sudden, he realizes Jesus is not there. Or, well, Jesus is there, but he's on trial. Jesus is at Pilate's praetorium. He's answering questions. It's a long corridor. There's a fire just outside back there. And Peter's warming himself by the fire. And a young Jewish girl walks by and says, You were with, you were with that Galilean. He says, I was not. And then about an hour later, still at the praetorium, Jesus is up there. A man comes by and says, You look so familiar. You, you you were with that Jesus guy. Man, I don't know him. And just a little while later, someone else walked by. I, it might have been the same Jewish damsel, I don't know. She come and she hears him talking. Ha, you were with him because your speech bereath thee. I can tell by the way you talk, it was your voice. See, I was at the General Assembly, and I went to uh, a booth. Um, strong tower insurance. I'm always looking for something cheaper for the church, right? And uh, this old guy got up. And I looked down and said, well, I'm waiting on the sales pitch. And he opened his mouth and he began to speak. I said, I know that voice. I know that voice. I looked at the business card and I said, Earl Burkett. My goodness gracious. I ain't seen him in 18 years, huh? He was a member of the Forest Street Church of God there. He was one of the ones that pledged the $984 a month from mine and Kelly's first ministry salary. Are you all with me? Say amen. And uh, I, I said, man, your speech, I, your voice, I couldn't, I remember that voice. And what this girl come by and said, I, I remember your voice and you were with that Jesus. He said, I, and he cussed. Don't know him. And when he said that, Jesus, standing in front of the praetorium, turned around immediately and looked him out of eye. And the rooster crowed. You understand what I'm saying? You see where I'm at? Just now, when he, when he thought he was in the clear, he turns around and there's Jesus. And he is the last time he sees Jesus alive or Jesus sees him, he's denying the Lord. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Here's the power of courage. Now, you might say he was courageous enough to, to deny the Lord. It, it would take courage to deny the Lord. But I, I tend to look at the other side of that and say that he was coward enough to deny the Lord. But the Bible talks about how he went astray, and so did they all. The only, in fact, the only one I remember specifically at the cross was John. When Jesus said to him, John, behold thy mother, talking about his own mother, and woman, behold thy son. In other words, John's going to take care of you like I would until you die. So let me try to tie this up. This is his denial. We, we see his, we've seen his determination. Uh, he had the, the, the courage to be determined. He had the courage to defend the Lord. And then he had, you, you decide, the courage or the cowardice, whatever it took. But, but he denied the Lord. Now, I will say this. While he messed up and he looked at the Lord in the eye, you know what he did? The very next thing, he broke and ran as hard as he could run. It probably wasn't too fast. 
But he got to a place alone. I'm going to tell you what happened to him. Here, here, what happened to him is what needs to happen to about 95% of all of us. And that's a good, gut-wrenching, heart-boiling cry out to God. Where it feels like our kidneys flow out our eyeballs. Are you hearing me? And that will fix about 99% of what's wrong in your life and in the church. It's when we can get a hold of God and see Him as high as He is and see ourselves where we're at. That's His denial. But then, oh, I'm telling you, there was a declaration that He made. I, I, maybe I should have started here, but nonetheless, I, I'm going to get here anyway. And, and I find in Matthew 16... And 13. I want you to just look at it with me. Uh, Matthew 16 and 13. We're going to find that Jesus has come into the region of Caesarea Philippi and he asked his disciples a question. And I'll put it to you right now. He says to his disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And I'm going to say this to you. Every one of us has got to answer this question. I know who John Sane says he is. huh? I, I, and I know who Ray Garner says he is. And I know who Harold Shedd says he is. But who does Mike Sane say he is? Who is Jesus in my life? Who is Jesus in your life? That's what he asks. He, he says to Simon Peter, I'm not asking you what he thinks. And I'm not asking you what she thinks. I'm asking you what you think. And he says, well, you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. This is his declaration. And oh, did it take courage. It might not take as much courage to say it right then, but he will defend it later. Watch. He said, Simon Peter answered and said, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. In other words, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you. Friend, I'm going to tell you, when you talk like this, you've been with the Lord. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father which is in heaven has revealed this to you. And I'm going to go a step further, and he's going to say, and, and, and behold, I'm going to give unto you the keys to the kingdom kingdom of God. Amen? And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Lord have mercy. His declaration. And then we come to a place where you know in fact I believe Luke it was that told us in chapter 10 that we'll tread on serpents and upon scorpions and uh no deadly thing shall harm us. It's a great place to be walking with the Lord. You can walk with the Lord in courage. Can you say amen? Uh, Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then there was another place that he said in uh, John chapter number 6, and somewhere around 63, 64 in that ballpark, he's talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And the Bible says from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Many of them decided to call it quits with this new religion called Christianity, following this Messiah even though he was the long-awaited one, even though he was the fulfillment of prophecy, even though the well-respected prophet Isaiah had said that, that he was the anointed of the Lord, even though there was time and time and time again prophecy after prophecy that was fulfilled. He was born in Bethlehem just as Micah had said. He, he, he was wonderful, counselor, prince of peace, everlasting father just as Isaiah had said. The virgin did conceive just as Isaiah had said. On and on and on it goes. But many of them, and I'm going to tell you today, Many people have walked no more with Jesus after having heard hundreds and hundreds of messages, after singing hundreds and thousands of songs, after feeling the wooing and the power of the Holy Spirit and goosebumps on top of goosebumps all the way to your toenails, standing in the presence of God, yet walk out and convince yourself it's not God. Something else out there. 
something else more exciting, more invigorating. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. But here's what the apostle said. I'm telling you, his courage invites courage. He looked at Jesus, and many of the people were walking away. They were going away from him. He's talking about his, he's not literally talking about biting a hunk out of his arm. He's talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. He's talking about the Eucharist, if you will, the, the, the body and the blood of the Lord, the sacraments that we take that show the Lord's death until he comes. He starts talking about these things, and many of them start walking away and leaving him and he looks at Simon Peter and says uh, will you also go away next verse though and Simon Peter looked at him and said Lord to whom shall we go for thou hast the words of eternal life amen thou this was his declaration he said Lord where in fact somebody wrote the song where could I go where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Needing a friend on whom I can depend. Where could I go but to the Lord? Yeah. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? The courage for the leader. I believe that he was the leader among the group. In fact, I can prove he was the leader among the group. His courage uh, enlisted the courage of others. His courage beefed them up. Because he was strong, they were made strong. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. And so a friend sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. If your friend is down and you go to him or her and you are positive and you are uplifting, you can pull them up out of the mother grubs. If you go to them and they are already down and then you download on them, you'll both be down. I'll give you another place, uh, another declaration that Peter said. This was one of these little trips. Jesus said to Peter, James, and John, follow me. They went up to the mountain, transfiguration. And uh, the Bible said while they were there, now I want to tell you something. Peter had a problem. I told you he was, he, he, he didn't have the best mouth. He slept in church. When Jesus was praying, all night in the Garden of Gethsemane, he fell asleep three times. So did all of them. And now the Lord, a week or two before his crucifixion, took him to the Mount of Transfiguration to show him something important. I'm going to tell you something. You know what? We come to church to be shown something important. God help me. Jesus took him to the Mount of Transfiguration to show him what he would look like in the eternal kingdom. To show him his glory. A prayer that would be answered that was 1,500 years old for the Mount of Transfiguration. Guess what? The prophet Elijah came representing all the prophets. Moses came representing the law. Moses came because he had said 1,500 years ago, Lord, show me thy glory. And 1,500 years later, he sat there as the Lord sat with his disciples, Peter, James and John, his favorite three. That's his inner circle. Here they are, and guess what? Heaven opens up. The, the countenance of Jesus is changed. It's like a metamorphosis upon him. He begins to gleam with a gleaming white, so bright that they couldn't hardly see him. And, they, well, of course, they fell asleep. Man, what happens when you miss something in church? Man, who felt that one, huh? It sort of bounced back. But he fell asleep. And all of a sudden, what in the world is this bright light? They woke up. I don't know if they thought a UFO landed or something. I don't know. But they woke up. And the first thing, and i got to give it to Peter. He don't miss a lick. And he jumped up. Hey, praise God. Lord, it's good for us to be here. Matter of fact, I might suggest to you, or shall I make a motion, that we build three tabernacles here. One for Moses, and one for Elijah, and one for yourself. Overlook the fact that I've been asleep for the last 30 minutes. That's just mycology there. You ain't got to buy it, but it's a fact. Now, I don't know that he said it, but he was asleep. That we cannot deny because the Lord tells us that he was asleep. But here he is on the Mount of Transfiguration. He did, you know what? He, here's what I can say about Peter. At least he was with the Lord. Huh? He was with the right crowd. He wanted to do the right thing. He was determined. To, he, 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 you know, I thank God for people that will try. 
He didn't always say the right thing. He sometimes had both feet in his mouth at the same time. Sometimes he was a clutch by some of the things he said. He was crazy sometimes. But thank God he was trying. Uh, <laughs> thank God he was trying. Well, that's not quite enough, so I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll quit preaching when the iPad dies. It's 7% right now. Right? No, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> he said, it's good for us to be here. I've got to tell you one more place. Tanya, if you'll follow me to Acts chapter 2. Um, anyway, we, we, we see the Apostle Peter in his, his declaration. We, and we got a little bit more of that coming, his defense, his denial. Uh, you know, we, we could have talked about defiance. Well, there's a number of things, but let me show you now. The Bible said, when the day of Pentecost fully come, they're in one mind. In one place with one accord. He said, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind that filled the house where they were sitting. There appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, sat, one set upon each of them. He said, And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spake, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. And there was dwelling in Jerusalem, what's this? Jews, devout men from every nation under the heaven. Now, I want you to understand, it was, it was important that it happened like this because... Passover came 50 days, or, or rather, Pentecost came 50 days after Passover. Passover was earlier, uh, and, and now 50. Penta means 50. This is Pentecost. This was a all-male Jews, 20 years old up, old up, and by law had to attend. And God has orchestrated this way on purpose. Watch this. And this sound occurred, the multitude came together, and they were confused because they heard everyone speak in his own language. God has got these people speaking in tongues. Some of them are speaking uh, in various languages and dialects from all over the known world at that time. What? They were all marveled, they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And he says, And how is it that we hear each one in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and those dwelling in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and the parts of Libya and adjoining Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. <laughs> so they were amazed and perplexed. Any of y'all ever been amazed and perplexed? I have saying to one another, whatever could this mean? The Hebrew or the Greek term is glossolalia, what they were hearing, the, the language. Others mocking said, they're full of new wine. <laughs> These people are drunk, man. Come on. You ever heard of drunk, man? They're babbling and rambling and carrying on. They know more Bible than Jesus. At least they think they do, right? What? He said, Peter's standing up. See, here's his declaration now. You remember last time we saw him? He wouldn't even admit he knew Jesus to a Jewish girl. He denied him three times. But now, oh no, no more. He says, uh, Peter standing up with the eleven raised his voice and he said to them, men of Judea, all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. Watch this. I might have been a coward at one time. I might have backed away. I might have been yellow at one time. But he said, I can tell you one thing. I won't never do it again. I'll, I'll, I'll never back away from what the Lord said. You know why? I'm filled with courage. I know the words of the Lord that told me that night at Passover that I would deny him and I was too arrogant. I was too full of myself. Huh? He said, but I've learned one thing. I will never leave him. I will never forsake him anymore. Watch, he says. But Peter, he stands there and he said, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose since it's only the third hour of the day. He said, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. He said, and the, shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I'll pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall uh, prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Let me hold that thought for a second. He says, uh, listen, that's what we need right now. Ishmael Prince Charles preached this on Wednesday night of the General Assembly. He said, we need a return to the pure Word of God. Stop being ashamed because we are Pentecostal. Stop being ashamed because we speak in other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. Stop being ashamed of prophecy if it comes forth. Let it come forth. Cultivate the gifts of the Spirit. Stir up the gift of God that is in you according to the Word of the Lord. It's not enough to say, I was saved 10 years ago. Listen, saved 10 years ago ain't going to save your grandchildren. 
An experience you had back yonder ain't going to save that teenage boy you got right now or girl. Huh? If they don't see mama and daddy's lips stammering under the Spirit of God, if they don't see you trembling in the presence of a mighty God, if they don't ever see you fast or ever see you pray, they're not going to fast. They're not going to pray. But if they'll see you bury your face in a pillow somewhere, if they'll see you under a heavy load because you just lost your job, bury yourself into a closet and say, I'm going to stay here until I hear from God. If they'll see you do something like that, it will make an impact on their life that they will never forget. They'll never forget. I won't never forget the longest day I live at uh, Wolfson Hospital when they told Adam and Chelsea that the chances of Micah's platelet count coming back was not good. They've ruled out that it's not the mother's antibodies fighting the babies, and we've never seen it come back this way. I had just got there. Kelly had just got there. Mom and Daddy was with me. Adam met us in a parking garage and fell to pieces. I couldn't even understand what he was saying. I was quietly standing there, hoping and praying, asking God, wanting with everything in me to be the prophet of the Lord and say, it's going to be all right in the name of Jesus. But I didn't have that revelation but his mama did. She put her arms around him and said, It's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. God's going to take care of it. And with everything in me, I was hoping, Please let that be a word from the Lord. Please let that be right. I done made the statement that God's good if he healed him or not. But I, I was reminded because we ain't dedicated them yet. We're going to do a mass dedication here in a while. We've got a lot of babies. We're going to give them all to God at the same time. But don't make no mistake about it. We gave him to God seconds after he came forth. I had the opportunity with his other grandfather and friends and family to pull him to me and hold him up to God in a room and say, God, he's yours all the days of his life. We give him back to you. We didn't have no idea we was on the edge of one of the greatest trials in our life. Because I'm going to tell you something. That week, nothing else mattered in this world to me. But what was revealed in his blood plate that count. Nothing mattered. I come to church on a Sunday morning. I just as well had been in the Atlanta airport waiting to go to Tucson, Arizona or something. But I wasn't really no good. I hope it blessed some of y'all, but... Just being honest with you. But what I'm saying is his mother had the, the wherewithal to put her arms around him. And there I am. There's daddy. There's my mom and everybody. We're praying and we're believing God. It takes courage to stand out and say what God wants you to say. You hearing me? It takes courage. Peter said, and the men shall dream dreams. Next verse 18 says, And all my men, servants, and maid servants, I'll pour out of my spirit in those days, and they'll prophesy. And I'll show wonders in heaven above, and the signs of the earth beneath, blood and fire, uh, vapor of smoke. Let me stop right there. I just want to say this. Peter would go on to say that this is for you and for your children, your children's children, as many as our Lord God shall call. I'm just simply saying this. Peter shows us the power of courage. He was a courageous man. And if you and I will be courageous about the right things, you just don't realize the people, the kids, the, whoever it may be, that you can impact just because you are courageous. And you're saying, yes, you can. So listen, as you stand with me tonight, please, please don't back away from what we know to be the truth. We're living in a society right now where people are backing off. I'm reading a tremendous book right now by Dr. Tim Hill about the mist. We're, now we're happy just to live in the mist, M-I-S-T, a mist of revival rather than the river of revival. We're happy if we can just see a move of the Spirit every quarter 
or every other week or something. Just, just enough, just a, 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 just a mist to just keep us from dying completely. But he says there was a day when we lived in the river of revival. That we lived in, in hopes and urgency and expectancy of what God would do when we got to church. And when we got bad news in the mail, we took it to the Lord in prayer. And when we, when we had problems with our children, we took it to the Lord. And now, you know what we're doing? We're looking within. How can I fix my problem? How can my Facebook buddies help me fix my problem? How can my neighbor help me fix my problem? And I, all of that has its place. I'm not trying to say to dish your friends. I'm not trying to say throw them out. I'm saying first, he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I'm asking you to have the courage to stand with him. I'm going to ask you now as Adam plays something that sings, perhaps. If you want to say, Pastor, I want the courage. I want the power of courage that Peter had. I'm not saying you're going to have his personality because obviously we don't all have his personality. Um, I may be kind of close to his personality. Uh, but some of us, some folks, they're not loud, they're not boisterous but they can say more in a paragraph this big than what it take me two days to say. Or, or their compassion runs so deep. There, there's, there's differing gifts in the body. Thank God we're not all alike. Thank God everybody's not like me. Thank God everybody's not like you. But I, I'm asking you right now, if, if you will, as Adam sings, would you... Come and let's pray. God, give me the courage. I'm going to tell you, friends, you're going to need courage in this last day. You're going to need courage to stand in this day. I'm telling you the truth. Things are tightening up on the church. The world don't view the church the way it used to. The government don't view the church the way it once did. It's going to take courage to stand for the Lord. I ask you to come as he sings this song.
to, to be, Lord. That, that person, that singer, musician, writer, Lord, that department head, Lord, whoever it is, God, whatever it is, make me that person. Let me be that soul winner, Lord. Give me the courage to tell my story. Give me the courage to lead others. Oh, hear the words of this song, would you? Sanchez by name. You, you know what I'm talking about. He was Jensen Franklin's music minister. He's probably 36, 37 years old maybe. I'm guessing that. Great, great, I mean great worship leader. The real deal, says Jensen Franklin. Tremendous guitarist. He opened the General Assembly with music. And I'm talking about literally throw down. He got to a point where he, uh, he stopped and gave a little testimony. And I'm still in this vein about your presence, your presence, your presence. Because it's not enough to have a survival. It's not enough to come to church once in a while. It's not enough to pay tithe. If we don't experience the presence of God, we're going to die. Ricardo said, he said, I was flying from home to Jacksonville. He said, I had my phone in the airplane mode 
He said, when I landed and turned my telephone on, it said 911, emergency, call home immediately. He said, I called my wife, and my wife said, Ricardo, it's bad. She said, our middle son has dove into the shallow end of a swimming pool and has broken C, I think, 3, 4, and 5. And you know what they say, if you break C4, you breathe no more. They have airlifted him to Scottish Rite Hospital, and the doctors are saying he has a 1% chance of living. Ricardo said, I got off of that airplane, I went to baggage claim, and fell in the floor in the Jacksonville airport. He said, and I don't know how many minutes I sat in the floor and wept like a baby and worshiped God. He said, when my luggage came out, I saw my guitar case. He said, and I grabbed that guitar case off the carousel and I opened it in the floor of the Jacksonville International Airport and I sat there and said, Oh, the blood of Jesus. of Jesus. He said, I began to sing it again and again and again. He said, I sang it, I sang it, I sang it until I felt I had entered in the presence of the Lord. I, I got into the presence. Oh, if you want to sing it, I don't know if you can sing it. Right there. <laughs> anyway, he talked about the blood of Jesus. He said, I sat right there and I worship God. He said, some people come over and begin to pray with me. He said, but I got a hold of God. And he said, I had to get up from there. I had to get my baggage. I had to get it back on the air, on another airplane. I had to book a flight. I had to go home. And I'm going with the news that my son has a 1% chance of living. He said, but I called on God. I got into the presence of the living Lord. Long story short, they had his son on video at the General Assembly and his wife. He's talking to us now. Are you with me? He's able to walk. He's able to breathe. He's normal. Yes, he went through some, some therapy. Yes, he went through some surgeries. He went through some things. But he's alive and he's well. And the devil said, 99%, I got him. I'm simply saying, there's going to be times in life that you better be accustomed to the presence of God so that you can go down in the presence of the Lord and get up and say whatever the answer is. That's what I'm willing to accept. When the three Hebrews said to the king, our God's going to deliver us. But they also said, if he don't, he's delivered us from you. When you get to the place in God where you realize that really it's about eternity and not this little staging area called life. Y'all hearing me? I know, I know we don't like thinking those terms, but all of us are headed that way. We're reminded more and more and more every day. I urge you to have the courage to get in the presence of the Lord. We still do prayer every morning, 7 o'clock, right here. We encourage you to be here. God bless you is my prayer. Please pray for the church. Listen, I want to tell you what the overseer told me. I sat with him. I, I met with our builder while we was there too. He told me Monday morning, this Monday coming, that we're going to do everything we can do that is in our power to make sure. And he says that Chris tells him that, that he's, you know, without, they don't ever want to say I'm 100%, but they say we are fairly certain that we'll close this loan by the end of the month, which the end of the month is what, Tuesday or Wednesday? I'm not saying that, but I'm thinking by Friday anyway. But um, I will keep you informed. Again, it's not in my hands other than no more than it is in yours. We're praying and seeking God, but we want to get it closed and finished as far as that end of it before Bishop leaves. He leaves on the 6th, or his last official day of business is the 6th of, uh, of August. So uh, anyway... Be in prayer about that. I'm excited. God's doing some great things. Amen. Josh, come on now, if you will, or Pastor Josh. You may be seated for just a moment. He's going to highlight just a few announcements, and then we'll be gone. All right. How many of y'all? I'm just so glad you came tonight. Amen.
I just want to tell you also back in college and career, awesome turnout, great presence of God back there as well. So God's doing some great things. All right, now next, this announcement I'm about to ask you, this lady don't ask for much, never asked me for anything, but she did ask me tonight to, to ask the people. This uh, coming August the 3rd through the 5th is the Kids Crusade, and we need nursery workers. And I know, I know everybody wants to be in here. And I understand that. And all I'm asking is that your king, your reward is in, in heaven. But if you'll just take just a little bit of time, there's a sign-up sheet. And if you can just do one night, if we just get a few people, then the burden don't have to be spread where one person has to stay in there all three nights and miss the entire thing. So just want to encourage you. And, 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 and I promise you, you don't understand how valid that ministry is until we take ten of them crying babies and put them in here. And you won't hear one word he says, because uh, you'll be looking around at which one's going off. Cause, uh, so I just want to say thank you to our nursery workers. But if you don't mind, there's a sign-up sheet, and it'll tremendously help us. Also, the Kids Crusade, we got a video if we can play it in just a second, and you'll love it. Uh, small groups, we just want to encourage you to take a look at your bulletin. Go online, go to Facebook. There's a lot of information there. And our meet and greet August the 21st. All right, we got a kids' crusade, and once this is done, we're going to release y'all. So thank y'all. Hi, I'm Mike Squeebly with Harbor News. We're here today live at the campaign headquarters of the Incredibles. Kids Crusade. I'm here today to interview Mr. Buford T. Peabody. Mr. Peabody, how are you doing today? Great, how are you, Lisa? I'm great. Uh, we're here today just to, uh, we want to find out what in the world is going on with this Kids Crusade. What is it all about? Well, you see, at this Kids Crusade, we are going to have many heroes. We're going to have Batgirl, Wonder Girl, we're going to have Superman, Batman, we're going to have Plunger Boy, that's my favorite. <clears throat> but we are going to teach these kids who the ultimate superhero is, and that's Jesus. Jesus. That would be Jesus Christ, correct? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Well, well what's going to be going on at this kids' crusade? They're going to be having all these uh, superheroes. What's going to be going on? Well, we're going to have skits. We're going to have live music. We're going to have an uh, awesome time. The kids are going to be leading music. And then we're going to have awesome preaching by Josh Cribbs, Miss Becky, and uh, Brother Mike Sang. He's the uh, pastor of the Harbor Worship Center, is that correct? Yes, sir, he is. Well, you've heard it straight from the horse's mouth. I'm Mike Squeebly, here live at the campaign headquarters of the Incredibles Kid Crusade. See you later. <laughs> that was filmed on scene here at the Incredible Kids Headquarters. So, uh, we encourage you. That's on Facebook. I mean, on YouTube, and I'll post it on Facebook in just a little bit. We encourage you to post these videos. People will watch these videos a whole lot more than what they'll they'll hear us. And I promise you, if they don't come for Mr. Peabody, I'm not sure they ain't going to come. So uh, y'all please get that out there. And uh, thank you so much, PJ and Brother Ken. I hope y'all have an awesome night. Have a safe week and come back and be here on Wednesday night. Love you guys. 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock on Friday and Saturday as well.